Some real good meetings, wasn't it? Yeah. I, uh, I hope you got folks enjoyed Brother Baker. I know that, uh, like I said, I really enjoyed the fellowship, the time we had together. It was, uh, it was good. I tell you what's, what's a blessing is when you see somebody that's stuck by the Word of God for 40-some years. Amen? Amen? I mean, the longevity, you just appreciate that. It says something about a guy. And um, again, there were some really, really good messages. And we've just made it through, obviously, the revival meetings. And I hope, that, I hope that some of you, uh, at some level or, an, or another, had experienced a little bit of revival in your hearts, amen? amen. Just a little bit of, you know, a little bit of the, the, a glimpse, anyway, of what the glory of God is really like. Um, I know that we've been through, uh, you know, some pretty straightforward pe- preaching with Brother Baker. That's one of the things I definitely remember about him is there was no holds barred, <laughs> right? I mean, he will, you know, he throws it right across the plate, waist high, straight as an arrow, and then it's up to you what you do with it. Uh, so that was, a, that was a blessing. And, you know, the temptation, uh, the temptation coming off of revival meetings like this is, I, I struggled with, with what to preach. Obviously, where do I go after you guys have been filled, your cups have been filled so much, and the, the temptation is just to continue kind of where he left off and just, you know, go straight for the juggler vein, <laughs> right? Just, just let, you know, let you have it, just kind of let you have it and go for it, okay? But I figured, I figured that may not be a good thing to do. I better not, that'll, we don't want anybody up here. Kids, no playing up here. There's no telling what you'll find. Um, but listen, the truth of the matter is, I know that even just since Wednesday, uh, some of you folks have had to face yet another giant in your life, amen? Um, some of you folks are still struggling with giants that were here prior to Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Sunday. Uh, many of you have possibly even experienced another defeat. Many of you have experienced, or some of you maybe have experienced a temptation to quit, um, Some of you, like I said just a moment ago, some of you still haven't gotten some of the giants in your life subdued and conquered. Amen? But you have been in the battle. And brethren, that's a good thing. You have been in the battle. You have been struggling. You have been fighting. And the wounds are there. I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever tried playing with a butterfly knife before. (laughs) Kids, I wouldn't recommend it without your parents' permission. But... Um, but when you take out things like that and you start learning to play with them, sometimes, you know, sometimes you cut yourself. I have a couple of scars on my hands from learning. <laughs> um, and the Word of God's the same way. The Word of God sometimes, sometimes cuts you and it leaves a few scars. Sometimes it leaves some open wounds. Sometimes, you know, you're sitting there after a revival meeting like that or after a certain preaching service, or after just sitting down and reading your Bible for a few moments, and you realize, you know, Lord, you just, you just laid a wound wide, wide open. Amen? I mean, I, I don't take this wrong, but I hope that you've experienced that to some degree. So I would like to take just a little bit of time this morning and again, nothing deep, nothing um, you know, really theologically um, high and mighty, but just take a little bit of time this morning to help maybe put a little bit of balm on some of the wounds that you may have, not to soften the impact of, of what you've been through, but to help heal a little bit, a little bit. all right? Proverbs 24, 16, a familiar verse to all of us says this. It says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Matthew 18, 21, uh, again, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking, and Peter comes to him, and, and it says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Tell seven times? Well, that makes a lot of sense considering, you know, seven's a great number in the Bible. But you all know the response. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. That is, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ is, no, 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 Peter, you don't get it. It's not just a once in a while type of thing. 
It is a continuous thing, and I don't, you know, I'm not even suggesting that 491 is too many, right? The principle is you're going to have to forgive a lot, and it's going to happen over and over and over, and things are going to happen. Listen, you're going to be wounded. You're going to suffer defeat in this Christian life. You're going to face failure in this Christian life, and if you stop and think about those two uh, passages of Scripture that I just, uh, just read, listen, it would help you if you would remember that the just man in Proverbs 24 did fall, right? I mean, we don't think about that a lot of times. We always concentrate and focus on getting up again, getting up again, keeping the battle going. And that's good because that's what we need to sustain ourselves. But the just man in Proverbs 24 did fall those seven times, right? Um, in, uh, in Matthew, listen, Peter is supposed to forgive his brother 490 times, right? Again, metaphorically, I take that to a certain extent. But when you think about that, remember the other side of the coin, that is this. There is a brother somewhere that 490 times has sinned, right? Right? I mean, we always look at those passages of Scripture and we look at it from our perspective as an, oh no, I have to forgive them again. Oh no, I have to forgive them again. Oh no, I have to forgive them again. And I'm not going to do that 490 times because we'd be here all afternoon and it'd get really boring if I did it even once or twice more. But the flip side of the coin is somebody is the one committing that transgression that needs to be forgiven of. And it says a brother 490 times. Now, I don't know which of the two people you are here this morning. That is, the one that's being asked to forgive 490 times, or if you're the one that is making the transgression 490 times. You ever think about that? Which one am I? But the truth of the matter is, you're probably both. Amen? The truth of the matter is, you are probably both. And there's a very good reason for that, and I'll tell you why. Because the Lord knows that if you're the one committing the transgression, and you're the one making the mistakes, and you're the one causing somebody else that kind of uh, aggravation and dilemma, listen, you should then be much more um, empathetic when you need to forgive somebody else. Amen? I mean, it's, it's good for you to open up and see those things. Uh, like I said, the reason is that the reason you experience both is the Lord wants you to see very plainly that if somebody has to forgive you time and time and time again, it's only right and it's only just and it's only fair and it's only reasonable that you would be expected to and asked to forgive somebody else that many times. Amen? Amen? Just a very simple thing. It's not too much to ask. Um, General Robert E. Lee, of course, uh, Confederate general, there's a, a book that was written about him, and it's reported in one of those books that there was a, a lady in Kentucky that General Robert E. Lee visited. And this lady took him to her, her plantation, to her house, and she was, she was very, you know, very angry and very upset. And she took General Lee to a, what was left of a huge tree that used to be in her yard. And this tree had just been battered and beaten down with cannon fire and, and gunshots. I mean, the, the branches were, were just almost non-existent. The trunk was almost torn apart. And she looked at, um, at General Lee for a, a word co to condemn the North, or at least sympathizing with her loss. And after a brief silence, uh, General Lee said to her, he said, Cut it down, my dear madame and forget it. It is better to forgive the injustices of the past than to allow them to remain. Let bitterness take root and poison the rest of our lives. And brother, that's some, that's some pretty good advice. Amen? That's some pretty good advice. Listen, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm uh, 63. Psalm 63. Psalm 63, the Bible says this. It says, O God, 
Thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall, be praise, uh, shall praise thee with, joy, with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings I will rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be um, a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Let's bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come back to you once again on a Sunday morning uh, and do ask that you would meet us here this morning. Lord, I know that once again there are many folks here in this congregation that are struggling with different issues. Father, um, we've just come through some revival meetings and had an opportunity to hear a lot of Bible in a very short period of time. And I know that the hand of God was here, and I know that you are working in people's lives. I just pray now that you would take the words of your book once again, apply them to our hearts, and feed us, Father, with the manna from heaven. Uh, take the balm of Gilead, put it on some of the wounds that we may have so that we might heal up, and once again, uh, stand up from a fall and serve the living God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've titled this, morning, this message this morning, again, very... Uh, a very simple message. When can I, when can I see God work? That is, when can I actually see God work? Notice, if you will, in Psalm 63, take a look at verse 2. Well, verse 1, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. And then he says this in verse 2. David says this. He says, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen in the sanctuary. So as I have seen in the sanctuary. Listen, folks, this morning, David's sitting here in the wilderness, and he's going through a rough time, and he's looking at, at God, and he's writing this psalm, and he's saying, Lord, I, when I go to the sanctuary, I can see the hand of God working. I go down to the church house and I see preachers come through and I see other Christians stand up and testify of what the Lord God is doing in their life and he says, when can I see that for myself like I see it down there? Amen? When can I see that for myself like I see it in other people's lives? That is this, when can I see God work? When can I see God work? David is looking to experience that experience that for himself. Turn, if you will, to uh, Deuteronomy. Keep your hand in Psalm 63, because we will be back there. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses, uh, the children of Israel are getting ready to go into the promised land, and Moses is kind of giving them a, um, uh, a reaccount of, of, of just some charges and things to think about. And Deuteronomy chapter 4 starts off by saying, Now therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I, which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess, possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I commanded you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor, for all the men that followed Baal Peor, they, thy God, hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land, whether ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and shall say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Look at verse 7. For what nation is there so great 
who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and to thy sons' sons. Listen, verse 4 said, um, listen, you got a chance to see God work, right? Ye that did cleave unto the Lord. You're here this morning, listen, you folks are the ones that, that maintain and are trying to maintain a relationship with the Lord, right? You're trying to do right. It's a struggle, I know. When can I see God? When can I see God work? Listen, when can you see God work? Listen, these folks in Israel, Moses reminded them, listen, you're the ones that clave to the Lord. You're the ones that stuck it out. You're the ones that kept going. And then he said this down in verse 7. Um, he said, for what nation is there among you that has a God that is so great? What nation is there so great because of God? Well, listen, you folks here, if you're saved this morning, you're the body of Christ. Amen. Right? You're a peculiar people to the Lord God himself. Listen, what people is there among you, besides you that has a God that is so great? Right? When can I see God work? Listen, we have all the benefits of the Bible. We have all the benefits of a risen Savior. We have all the benefits of a God that's, that created the universe. Amen. You say, when can I see God work? Right? When can I see it? I know if I go down to the sanctuary, I'll see it. I know if I look at other Christians and look at their lives, and, and I look at them, and sometimes even there's a little bit of envy, and you look at them and you go, man, how come the Lord doesn't treat me like that? How come I don't get to see the Lord work in my life like I see him work sometimes in somebody else's life? It's a common problem we all have. Turn back to Psalm 63. When can I see God work? When can I see God work? When is he going to do for me what I see him do when I go down to the sanctuary? All right? That's a good question, brethren. And just three, you know, three simple things, three simple things that hopefully will help you out a little bit. Like I said, nothing real deep, just something to think about. Take a look at um, Psalm 63 once again. And I would just say this, look at verse 1. Oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. Early will I seek thee. Listen, when will you see God work? When you seek him, early in the morning. Now we've all been through that, we've heard that, and we've been told time and time again. Listen, when you, got, when you get up out of bed in the morning, hopefully you ha at least have God on your mind. Hopefully you wake up in the morning and you go, Lord, thank you, help me for another day. Just, uh, you know, help me to, to get through this day and, and do what I need to do and, you know, keep me safe on the roads. Hopefully you take a few moments and, and get your, your Bible out and look at a little bit of Scripture, even if it's just a little bit. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes in the mornings when I'm in a rush and I sleep late, you know, because I've got to be to work at 6.30, sometimes I do, I take my phone with me. Listen, I'll sit down at work pull up my phone, and, and read my Bible. Amen? Amen? Listen, we don't even have to have the embarrassment of lugging around a great big old black Bible. Ha <laughs> ha, look at me, world, I'm a Christian. No, we got a little phone. We can just go, ha, oh. everyone thinks you're looking at Facebook. <laughs> you don't even have to be embarrassed about it anymore, right? <laughs> but listen, I hope you just take a little bit of time and, and just, just look at it and just say, okay, Lord, give me something here this morning. You say, when can I see God work like I see him work down at the sanctuary? I tell you when you can see God work, when you just take a little bit of time and seek God early in the morning, right? You'll, know, you'll notice your day will go a lot better. You'll notice there'll be a little bit of uh, invigorating influx of the Spirit of God, and it'll help you through some of those rough times in the day. When can I see God work? Well, I tell you when you can see God work, when you just take a little bit of time to... Seek him early in the morning. Uh, Proverbs 
18, 17 says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. What a promise that is. I mean, you're going through a rough time. You got the wounds from from the revival meetings. You got the wounds from things going on in life. You got the wounds from reading your Bible, and you saw you in there again this morning. That's always rough to deal with. Hey, listen, seek the Lord early. And he says, if you seek me, you'll find me. The Lord, listen, the Lord is just sitting there waiting to help you. But so often, so often we go on about our business, about our day, and we don't give the Lord a second thought because I got to hurry. I got to eat breakfast. I got to get through traffic. I got to get my work started. I got to get this accomplished. I got I to gotta go. I got to run. This is important. This is really, really important business. I can't get through the day until I get all these tasks done that my supervisor assigned me. And you forget about God. And then you wonder why you don't see him work. You wonder why you have to go to the church house to see him work in somebody else. When can I see God work? I tell you what, if you just give him an opportunity, you seek him early. Just seek him early. You'll see him work. I don't have a a, a real long time. I need to to get moving, but... um, Take a, well, I'll just read it to you. Later on in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, back there where we were in chapter 4, down in 29, it says, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou shalt seek him with all thy heart, with all thy soul, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, notice it said, even in the latter days. That means even when everything's been a mess for quite a while. Even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them. Listen, you want to see see God work for yourself? Take a little bit of time to just seek him early. Right? Early in the morning. I'll tell you when else. Seek the Lord early in, when the problem starts. I mean, it, it just kind of goes to make sense. Don't wait. Don't wait until the problems become so large and so overwhelming that you're pressed down with all of that weight and you can't figure out how to get out of this mess. Right? Seek the Lord early. We think, get up early in the morning. Oh, no, I'm going to miss out on a few minutes sleep. Okay, I got it, right? That's a struggle. Our flesh hates it. So does mine, just like you, I struggle with it. Seek the Lord early, but listen, there's another application. Seek the Lord early in the problem. I mean, just as soon as things start going wrong, start looking to God for an answer, right? I mean, David s- sought the Lord early, and listen, if you, the longer you wait, the more difficult it is. You know that by experience, don't you? Don't you? The longer you wait, the tougher those problems get, the more you're inclined to look somewhere else. Why is it that we always just wait to the last minute? I mean, most Christians, listen, we want to solve the problem ourselves. We wait, we delay, and finally, if things get really, 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 really bad, then we'll pray about it. (laughs) Listen, the principle is seek the Lord early. doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how small the problem is or how small you think. The problem is because small problems turn into big problems I don't know if I ever told you about one of my diving stories I'm, I don't have time to tell it to you today and I'm, I'll use it on a different message but small problems turn into some big problems all right I mean big enough problems when I got out of the water I didn't know whether I wanted to get back in the water or not <laughs> all right listen seek him early when can I see God work like I see him work down at the sanctuary, when I'll take a little bit of time and just seek him early. All right, early in the morning, start your day off right. But listen, early in the problem as well. All right, go, listen, before you go on a trip, yeah, listen, pray and ask the Lord for safety. Don't wait till the tire goes flat. All right? <laughs> and if the tire does go flat, don't think it's because you didn't pray. Unless you didn't. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Seek the Lord early. You know what the Bible says in Ephesians 4? You know the verse. We, all, we know this stuff. We can, 
I can start the verse right. I can start the verse, and I bet 90% of you can finish it. Be angry and let not the sun go down upon your. Right? We all know it. What's the principle? Don't let it go too long. I don't know if I if I told you this or not, but I remember you know my wife and I were having a, a little marital spat one time. <laughs> this is years ago, and I thought to myself, oh, and I thought, sun's already down. I don't have to make up with her till tomorrow evening. <laughs> Isn't that about the way we do it? <laughs> Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Well, it's already down today. I don't have to worry about it till tomorrow. I don't think that's what it was trying to relay. But that's how we naturally do it, right? Listen, you want, the, you want to see the God work for yourself? Seek him early. Seek him early. And I better go because this is only point one. I got three points and we're already getting close to, mid, uh, to noon. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Listen. Um, when can I see God work? I'll tell you when I can see God work. When I need him. When I need him. Uh, Brother Baker said something about uh, midday that kind of struck my mind and got me to thinking about this. And um, you take a look down to Psalm 63 and verse 2, see the, uh, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. The sanctuary. Oh, well, that's during the middle of the day, right? So then I thought, uh, I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, I wonder what happens on midday in the Bible. So I looked it up, and I got to looking at it, and the word midday only occurs three times in your Bible, all right? The first time it occurs is in 1 Kings 18, and we don't need to take time to go there. You know the passage, but Elijah is there, and he's... he's um, Fighting with the prophets of Baal, there's, there's 450 prophets of Baal plus an additional 400 prophets of the grove. There's 850 prophets there that he's battling with. And again, you all know the story. The people of Israel were kind of, they were, uh, um, you know, in a fix between two. And Elijah told them, okay, listen, who's going to be your God? If Baal's going to be your God, serve him. If the Lord's going to be your God, serve him. Who are you going to serve? And they were kind of hesitant. They didn't know what to do. And Elijah said, okay, fine. Uh, he told the prophets of Baal, hey, listen, there's 850 of you. There's only one of me. You guys go first. Get yourself a calf, bring it up to the altar, and call on your God and see if he'll answer by fire. And then I'll do the same thing, and whichever one answers by fire, let him be God. You know the story. The prophets of Baal got up there. They, they got the calf. They put it on the altar. They started dancing around, calling on their God. Hear us, O Baal. O Baal, hear us. Hear us, O Baal. O Baal, hear us. And they did all the religious things that people do. And you know what? Nobody answered by fire. And it says in there in the passage of Scripture, they started cutting themselves. Because, right? That's... What you, that's what people do when they associate themselves with those kind of gods. They're trying to show their sincerity. And no, nobody answered. And I've got to go back there because I can't do justice. I, I don't have it off the top of, of my head uh, in memory. But let me, let me just turn to that passage for just a second because I love it. I love what Elijah says. Um, And he says this. Anyway, they, um, from, it says from morning until even, and, uh, uh, from morning even until noon, they were calling on Baal, Baal saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leapt upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon, midday. Ha, you got the connection, right? It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. Well, praise the Lord. Now, we're told in today's society this is not a good thing. We don't want to offend them. All right? But Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god, small g. Either he is talking, he's on the cell phone, or he's pursuing, or he's on a journey, or pre-adventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Elijah, Elijah mocks them. And of course, nothing happened. They were after the wrong God. Then Elijah gets out there, you know the story, put all the water on the, uh, on the altar and on, covered the bullock with uh, barrels of water. 
And he stood back, and the Lord answers Elijah by fire. And it said in there it was noon, but a little later on the passage, it uses the word midday. Listen, when, when can I see God work? You need him at midday when you're in the middle of a battle. Elijah was out there getting ready to fight those prophets of Baal, and he had a contest going. I mean, God's reputation was at stake, right? And the heathen did everything they could do, and there was no one to answer. Why? Because God wouldn't let him. Amen. Don't you know Satan was chomping at the bit, waiting to do something? Amen. And the Lord told him, nope, not today. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I tell you, when, when can you see God work? Listen, you need him early in the morning, but you need him at midday. Not only when you're in a battle, but when you, when you return. When you return. In Nehemiah chapter 8, um, he read unto them therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women. Again, you know all the story. The children of Israel had been in captivity um, for 70 years. They came back to Jerusalem. They started building the wall around Jerusalem. They started building the temple. And, and Ezra gets up and he starts reading the scriptures, reading the Bible from morning until noonday to all the people. They return to the land. They return to the land, sat there and listened to the word of God read until midday. Listen, when can you see God work? When you give them a chance early in the morning, when you give them a chance early on in the problem, but you can see God work in the midday when you're in the middle of a battle and you need for him to answer you. And you can see God when you finally get to the place during the middle of the day when you return to where you should have been at the beginning. Those children of Israel had been gone out of that land into captivity because of their own transgressions, because of their own sin, but they finally made it back. And they sit down, and at midday, the, I mean, Ezra's up there reading the scriptures, and you know what? They had a chance to see God work. And he'll work for you. He will. He'll work for you. When you need him in the middle of things, in the midday, when you need him in battle, listen, when you finally get around to realizing that you, like the children of Israel, need to return to the land that you came from. That's when you'll see him work. That's when you'll see him work. The people that were still back in Babylon, they didn't see it because they didn't return. Again, when can I see God work? Listen, you see him work early, you see him work at midday. And then the one that prompted uh, me with this is, listen, you can see the work, you can see the God work in midday if you're lost here. This is the reference that Brother Baker made in Acts uh, 26. Of course, it's Paul on the way to Damascus, and he's giving his, his testimony. And he said, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, uh, and them which journeyed with me. The apostle Paul was lost. He was on his way to Damascus, we know, to, to persecute Christians. And at midday, the Lord intervened in his life, and he saw a light from heaven, and you know what? There are some things that were made perfectly clear to him that day, around noon, that he didn't really understand before. When can you see God work like you see him work down at the sanctuary? David said, listen, when I go down to the sanctuary, I see God work down there. But David wanted to experience that himself. Listen, do you want to experience that yourself this morning? I hope so. Why sit around and watch it happen to everybody else? Amen? Why sit around and watch it happen to everybody else? Why miss out on it yourself? Seek him early, early in the day, early in the problem. Seek him at midday. Listen, when you're in the middle of a battle, he'll show up like he did for Elijah. When you return, when you finally return, you've been in captivity for a while. 70 years is a long time to be in captivity. When you finally return, the Lord will be there and he'll show up. And if you're lost, like Paul on the road to Damascus, listen, the Lord will show up and he'll be a bright light. There's um, a story that's told about a gentleman, um, his name is Ernest Gordon. 
And if you remember the, um, the river, the bridge on the River Kauai, the uh, American soldiers, and this guy was Scottish, but he was a soldier and he was in captivity under the Japanese. And they were forcing them to build this, this bridge. So you had all these prisoners you know, that were being abused viciously. And they were marching the prisoners back uh, to the camp one day after working, and they stopped and they did a, a check. And they did a count on the number of shovels that were supposed to be in the group. And they counted, and they were one shovel short. And the Japanese were furious at the prisoners because they had lost or were hiding or had stolen or had thrown away or whatever. They were furious because that shovel was missing. And one of the Japanese soldiers pulled out a pistol and was getting ready to, to kill all the, uh, the prisoners because that shovel was missing and he wanted to know who did it. Finally, one prisoner in line stepped out front and admitted to the transgression. And the Japanese soldiers took another shovel and they took it and they beat him to death and then shot him. Well, those prisoners picked up that man's body. They gathered all their stuff. They're near starvation anyway. And they're hauling this guy back to the camp. And they come up uh, closer towards the camp and they get back to a second point where they're going to do another check. And they went through and they counted the shovels again. And they had the right number of shovels. That guy had stepped forward even though he had done nothing wrong. They had miscounted the first time. Listen, isn't that just like the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you if you're lost here this morning? You understand the Lord Jesus Christ saw the punishment that had to be paid and he volunteered to step forward and take that punishment upon himself for sins that were committed that weren't his. And Paul came face to face with that on the way to Damascus at midday. When can you see God work? Early. Seek him early, right? Early in the problem. Tell you what, you can seek him, you can see God work in the midday when you're in the middle of a battle, when you're finally to the point where you're ready to return where you should be. And if you're lost here this morning, you can see God work. You can see it. It won't just be one of those things that you see when you go down to the church house and you look around you and you go, oh, God's working in all these other people's lives. Listen, you can see God work when you see the one that stepped out in front of that formation and took the punishment for you. And that becomes a reality. Those soldiers had no idea what was going on until the next time the shovels were counted and they were all there. But that soldier was willing to take that punishment so that everybody else didn't have to suffer. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you. Amen. When can I see God work? When can I see him work? At midday, when I'm in the middle of a battle, right? When I return to where I should be as a Christian, I get myself back in the land because I've been gone for a while. Or if, or if you're lost, when you realize what the Lord Jesus Christ actually did for you, like happened to Paul at midday on the way to Damascus. Finally, back in Psalm 63, take a look down. Uh, verse 3, Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Ooh, some of us have a good head start. <coughs> And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. And then he says this in verse 6. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. I'll tell you the third time when you can see God work for you. Okay? For you. Not for somebody else at the church house. But for you. That is when you meditate upon him at night. Listen, I know this. I know that sometimes we go to bed and we are 
we're sleepless, we worry. We're masters at worrying, Is, aren't we? Aren't we masters at worrying? Aren't we masters at taking things in life and we just, we lie on our bed at night. You ever been there? You lay down on bed at night and your brain is racing so much about all the things that are going on that you just, you can't get to sleep, Amen. right? You're worried about it. Isn't that a shame? Listen, when you're sleepless, when you're sleepless at night, you can see God work. Psalm, um, I don't have time to go through a, a bunch of it, but if you get a chance, take a look at Psalm 77. But in 77 verse 6, it said, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart and my spirit, and my spirit made diligent search. David's sitting there in the middle of the night, worrying about things. And you know what he did? He sought the Lord in the middle of the night when you're worried. You're lying there in your bed. You can't get asleep. You say, how can I, how can I see God work? I'll tell you what. When all the cares and the pressures are on top of you and you can't even sleep, listen, <laughs> seek the Lord. Amen. Right? Go find the Lord. Get a hold of the Lord. Ask the Lord to give you some reprieve. And he'll be there for you. Again, it's nothing, not deeply theological stuff. It's just practical stuff. But we don't think about it. We lie in bed at night and we have all this stuff rolling through our minds and we are so agitated and aggravated or we're so upset or we're so worried that we lie there in our bed at night and we can't even go to sleep because we got 500 things running through our mind all at the same time. And we miss the Lord. And we don't see him work. Because we don't seek him. Mary Crowley said this. She said, every evening I turn worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. <laughs> Somebody said this. It says this, it says, worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. <laughs> That's pretty good. Think about that for a second. Worrying is, to, is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. You know what Psalm 127 too says? It says this, it says, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. You know what the Lord said in that thing? He said, listen, it's not going to do you any good. It is a waste of your time to get up early in the morning and worry all day long and not be able to go to sleep at night because of all your troubles and all your worries. He said, wait a minute. He, Lord gives his beloved sleep. Turn it over to the Lord. Seek the Lord. I mean, you got one or two options. You can try to take care of it yourself, or you can give it to him. He's going to be up all night anyway. Amen? Amen. Listen, when can I see God work early, midday, and I can see him work in the night when things aren't going so well, too. I can see him work in the night if I'm sleepless, and I can see him work in the night when I am scared. When the troubles that you're facing, when you're afraid... Listen, the Lord can show up if you'll give him a chance and soothe your worries and soothe your fears and set your heart at ease and give you sweet rest. Anything other than that, you're basically saying to him, you're pretty sure that he's not going to take care of you, right? For several years, a woman had been having trouble uh, getting to sleep at night because she was afraid that a burglar was going to come in and rob the house. Um, one night, her husband heard a noise in the house, so he went downstairs to investigate. When he got there, he did find a burglar. Good evening, the man said. Uh, I'm pleased to see you. Come upstairs and meet my wife. She's been waiting for you for 10 years now. <laughs> You 
You know the verse, uh, Psalm 56, 3, it says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. When can I see God work? Listen, I can see God work for me early, midday, but I can also see God work for me when it's night, in the night watch, right? When I'm sleepless and worried, listen, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. I mean, it sounds easy to quote the verse. A little more difficult to do in reality. But you got to be able to get to the place where you say, Lord, this is more than I can handle. This is more than I can take care of here tonight. It's beyond me to control. It's up to you. Whatever happens, happens. Help me to get some sleep. Right? And if I die in the middle of the night, okay, I wake up in heaven if I'm saved. If you're not saved, hmm, not so good an outcome. Okay? But at some point in time, you have to be able to say, Lord, this is more than I can take. Take it from me. And when you're afraid, when you're scared, in the middle of the night, and those fears run through your mind, and you're convinced that everything in the world is going to go bad, that nothing is going to be good for you, and you convince yourself that all these terrible things are going to happen, listen, that's the time when you need to get with the Lord, seek his face, at what time I am afraid, at what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. When can I see God work? Right? When can I see God work? Listen, you can see God work if you will get up early. Get in your Bible early. Spend some time in prayer. Okay, pray on the way to work in the car. With your eyes open. <laughs> okay? Let me put, throw that caveat in there. Pray on your way to work. Get the Bible on your phone. Look at your phone. Read through some Bibles. No one will even know it. But spend some time with the Lord. Get something from Him early. Don't wait. The longer you wait, the more things are going to build up. Right? Seek Him early in the problem. Listen, you need Him at midday when you're in the middle of a battle like Elijah was. Right? You need them at midday like the children of Israel when they got back into the land. When you've been gone and the Lord has finally impressed upon you that you need to return to the place where you ought to be. Right? He'll be there for you waiting. You need them at midday if you're lost. Like Paul on the road to Damascus. That light that he looked up at was brighter than the sun. And he knew, this is God talking with me. And listen, if you're lost here this morning, God will show you, I'm talking to you. Amen? I'm talking to you. And you need him in the night. Because of worries and troubles that you face, you've got to get to the point where you can turn them over to the Lord. And because of fears that you battle with, and fears that you face, you've got to get to the place where you realize the Lord is going to take care of me. Listen, I can sit here and come up with all kinds of possibilities of how bad things are going to be tomorrow or next week or for the rest of my life. All right? I can think of all kinds of things that are going to go wrong. And if I let my mind think on those things, right? What does the Bible say? Think on things which are good, right? Think on these things. Because your mind can control where you, your attitude goes. And if you think on those things and you don't let the Lord in to take care of them, where do you expect it to go? The devil will take it and run with it. But if you want to see God work for you, seek him early. Seek him in the midday Amen. and seek him at the night.
and he'll be there for you. Amen? He'll be there for you. Right? I don't know what you faced, you know, coming through revival. I don't know what, you know, things the Lord's been dealing with you on, maybe for six minutes, maybe for six years. But I know, I know how to find the right balm to get those things healed up. That's how you do it. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our right, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for a chance to be back here on a Sunday morning. Lord, your Bible is so good. It gives us so many answers to our troubles and our trials. And Lord, I just pray now that you would apply the balm of Gilead to each and every individual that's here. Father, as we get into this book, as we hear preaching, uh, as we analyze ourselves, sometimes it's, it's hard, Father, to accept the things that we see. But Lord, in the long run, you care about us. In the long run, just like for Israel, Father, you're sitting right there waiting for us to seek you. And you've promised us that if we'll seek you with our heart, that you would be there and we would be able to find you. Oh, Lord, I cling to that promise here this morning, and I pray that each and every individual here does as well. If there's somebody here who's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, Father, I pray that you'd give them a heart to seek you for salvation. That, Lord, has to be the first and, and primary uh, goal of their life, really. But, Lord, for other Christians here who just struggle with daily battles and some minor, some pretty severe, Father, give us a heart to seek you early before things get out of hand. Seek you in the, mid, in the midday for battles and to seek you at night, Father, when we lay our head in be, on our pillow in, in bed and we have trouble sleeping because we're worried or we're afraid. Help us, Father, to seek your face in that circumstance as well. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless your people here this morning, deal with their hearts, and Father, you'd watch over and protect. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.